Alonzo, thank you so much for the time. How you doing today? I am good, Trey. How you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, from us talking a little bit before hitting record, I just learned that this weekend is not going to be your first time performing at the Comedy Mothership. You are headlining there this weekend, but you did a guest spot back in April. What were your initial impressions of this club that is getting a lot of love from both audience members and comedians alike? All right. As a comedian, I will tell you the single best thing about the comedy mothership. When you're in the green room, there's only one remote control for the television. Now, trust me on this. I've been to clubs all of, there's always at least three remote controls and only one person who knows how to use them. And that guy's never in the sound booth when the game is on. So the mere fact that they made the mothership have one remote control, you're like, this is the best club in the country. This is the A club. <laughs> So because you're headlining this weekend, if you want it on the uh, the Clippers preseason game, do they have to abide by that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The headliner controls the TV. No, it, it's a great room. It's very uh, friendly. The people are right on top of you, so the energy's good. The focus is on the stage. Like all the things that make a comedy club great, the mothership has. So, so it's a great room. And just doing the guest spot, I had a blast. Plus, you know, we're we're all like veteran comics, man. You know, when you're there's nothing better than hanging out with a bunch of old friends who are veterans. So when I did my guest spot that night, Joe was there, Burr was there, Harlan Williams was there. You know, it's that was like I don't I don't know like old home week or something. And the club has a good vibe. When a club has a good vibe, you get a better show. My goodness, what a uh, what a list right there of guys performing comedy that night and that was in the first month of the club being open too and i don't know if you had a chance to work both the uh, the bigger and smaller rooms but both rooms have their own feel also on top of obviously being treated properly acoustically to where the labs are reverberating but not echoing too much and uh the you know the crowd is jammed in there like they should be at a good comedy club another detail that uh, people have talked about that i think is a good quality at a solid comedy club is that there's not any food being served up either so while people do get to drink they're not distracted by fried chicken fingers or whatever else is going on in the kitchen uh being cooked up and served while you're trying to tell jokes too well this club has the unusual distinction of being built for comedy yeah. Most comedy clubs and, and the club owners will tell you, and I get it. They're like, listen, we're in the food and beverage business and we do comedy. But, you, you know, their bread and butter is, is the food and drinks. So I, I remember, listen, I remember early on when I started and this comic, a veteran at the time, told me, he said, listen, man, if they could figure out how to sell the food and drinks without us, we wouldn't be here. So <laughs> but but the mothership's made for comedy. So the focus is on comedy. And uh, that's very cool. Also, you know, the comedy clubs that do serve food, not the highest end kitchens, good snack food, this or that. But, you know, you want to go out, you want to go out to dinner and impress her. You might not want to feed her at the club. So <laughs> it works out. Yeah. Quesadillas and French fries. You know, that's fine for my nine and seven year old kids. I don't know how well that works out for a date, though. <laughs> So uh, you've also performed in Austin over the years, too, at the old Cap City. And then uh, you're such an old school guy that you go back to the Velveeta Room, which is actually still around, still doing uh, comedy most nights out of the week. What are your impressions of getting to perform in Austin all these years? And is it surprising at all that it has turned into this stand up mecca seemingly out of nowhere? Well, Austin's a great city, right? It's always been the the non-Texas city in the center of Texas which is which is very cool, uh, very open minded crowds and all that stuff. And trust me, I have worked, you know, Midland, Odessa, Beaumont, mm. you know, I've been all over Texas. I've done road. High. I've, I know Texas. So Austin, yeah, a bit different than the rest of Texas. But the Velve, the Velveeta room, that room is awesome. That is old school comedy that that's, you know, there's nothing better than like a, I don't know, 80 seat room with 100 people in it and and a small stage that you're sweating on that's when there's something about the creativity of that kind of room it, it almost brings a jazz feel to it like i work with a lot of jazz musicians and do stuff in that world and the velve has that kind of feeling just pure creativity so i loved it i, I like 
doing little rooms like that for fun. You know, Cap City was great. I mean, I worked Cap City a long time ago. Uh, I don't know, early 2000s. And I know it's changed since then. I haven't been to it. But yeah, I'm not surprised Austin developed a scene. I mean, it had the music scene. I will say the mothership is probably the mothership and the moon tower comedy festival those are the two things that made austin a spot for comedy you know because they they brought comics in like with moon tower you bring in comics from all over the country all over the world and you just hang out and you're bouncing around venue to venue to theaters and the little clubs and and this and that so yeah it makes it it makes a lot of fun i'm not surprised at all another thing about austin i have a friend who moved to Austin, you know, before everyone moved to Austin. He moved there, I want to say in the late 90s. And he said, yeah, anywhere in the country is a three hour or less flight. You know, because comics, we travel all the time. He's like, you're in the middle of the country. So anywhere you go, you don't have a long flight, which made a lot of sense. So Austin makes a lot of sense for, for comics and for comedy. And for me, voodoo donuts, you know, listen, you got voodoo donuts. They're open all night. I'm there. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get fat while I'm in Austin. I'm sorry. That's what That's I do. literally a block away from the mothership at this point too. You think I didn't know that Trey? Do you think I didn't know that? Who are who you talking the, to? Who was the first <laughs> who moved to Austin in the, the late 1990s from comedy? His name was Scott Kennedy. Hmm. Tragically, he died far too young. He was only um, in his late forties when he passed away. He started booking when the, the Iraq war started, he started booking comics to go to Iraq. I went with him twice. He took over, I think, I want to say somewhere between 45 and 50 shows to Iraq. And he would take us to like the big USO shows in Iraq, you know, when Leno went, Drew Carey or, or people like that. They go to the big main base and they do a show for 10,000 people. Scott was taking us to what they call FOBs, forward operating bases. And sometimes you'd go there and there's only 45 people there, right? And, and 30 of them are at the show in the mess hall while the other 15 are on patrol and stuff like that. He was a, he was a fantastic guy. It was a fantastic thing that he did. And again, tragically, he died uh, far too young, but he was a good dude. And yeah, he moved to Austin long ago. Was that the most unique? performing circumstance that you've ever done stand-up for oh no i've done stand-up anywhere it should be done in a hell of a lot of places it shouldn't be done but doing military shows it's it's super fun because there's a mutual appreciation right because they appreciate the show you know being in the military most people in the military will tell you they call it groundhog day it's the same thing over and over and iraq was weird because there's a war going on, but there's also just being there a lot of rules, like no alcohol and everything is is kind of this dusty brown color and it's hot. It is, you know, 110, 115. I mean, it's a it's a tough just the life that they deal but beyond the, the danger of war and IEDs and all of that, just the day to day. The comedy shows come in, we break that up for them. We give them something else. We make fun of the officers that they're not allowed to make fun of. They all love it. The officers are very cool about that. And then we get to see what they do. Like, you know, when we're home and people say, you know, um, I appreciate the troops, support the troops. It's like, really, really? Do you really support the troops? Because we asked for a $5 tax increase and you said no. You know, it, but when you get to go there and really show them, hey, thank you all for what you're doing. You, you know, it's it's a weird situation, uh, impossible to describe. We appreciate your service. We appreciate you being over there. And as a bonus, on occasion, and I'm not going to go into detail, they let you play with their toys. And I'm not going to say what I got to play with, but it was fun. Although the Navy never let me blow up a fishing boat. I always wanted to say, hey, can we just blow up a fishing boat and say it was an accident? And they wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> Molly pirates out there. I mean, it's not like anybody's <laughs> going to miss them anyhow, right? Uh, you would think, but no, apparently I'm not allowed to fire a ship's gun. <laughs> that's, that's a shame or maybe not so much. So uh, if performing in front of the military is one of those worthwhile moments, you mentioned that there are plenty of places that have no business hosting stand up. What is one of those places? Oh, well, I'll, I'll give you a Texas one. I did a roadhouse bar gig in Beaumont 
this is early in my career. So it's in the mid nineties and there's this guy heckling me and I'm just, you know, I just leaned into him, right? Just wore the guy out. And after the show, they're like, it's about time someone shut him up just because he runs the clan down here. I'm like, really? Really? Nobody thought to tell me that before. <laughs> oh my goodness. You run into crazy local things like that, that, that are funny and weird and, and, you know, stuff like that. I was telling Joe, I was, um, I'm trying to remember the place. It was, is it St. John's Island? It's a little island off of Newfoundland in Canada. Like it, it's, it's like the easternmost tip of Canada, you know, nowhere, just little island. You got to fly like a 12 seat puddle jumper to get there, blah, blah, blah. And I go into this bar and there's a Joe Rogan experience sticker on the bar. I'm like, Joe, you are everywhere. You are literally everywhere. So stuff like that, it, it's fun. I mean, I, I listen, I still love stand up. I love the creativity of it. So I tell everyone they pay me to travel and I tell jokes for free. I've, I've worked any and everywhere in the world. They speak English and some places they don't. I did a show in Pakistan and right before the show, I had Pakistan coming out of both ends, Trey, both ends. Mm. But as a comic, you hold it in for one hour and then you get off stage and you lose a couple of pounds. That's all I'm going to say. That's a, that's a love for the game moment right there, Alonzo, is uh, when you're having to stave off food poisoning in order to perform your craft. Like I imagine that if, if you've ever done India before, considering what India does, like how they actually clean themselves after going number two, and then how the left hand is for that and the right hand is for shaking and preparing food. But when you're preparing food, you're using both hands and how much hand washing is going on. There's a very obvious reason why people who don't live in India go over there and get really sick in doing so once they start to eat the food. Yeah, some places some places can be a bit risky. You know, the, the funny thing in, in Pakistan, so everyone in Pakistan has a cousin who's a doctor. I don't know what that is. It's, bunch of doctors. And when I got sick and we figured it out, it, it had to do with, um, I think, brushing my teeth. Like we were staying at this resort, the water was filtered, blah, blah, blah. Just one of those things. And they said, listen, it's 24 hours. They said, we can take you to the hospital. We can give you fluids or whatever. But if you just drink Gatorade, you'll be fine in 24 hours. And it was almost to the minute that mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I'm good. So, you know, I mean, things like that happen. It, it's, it is what it is, but the experience of seeing these different places, I, I, I tell people there's no better education than traveling. When you travel the world, you get to experience things and see things and that you would never otherwise see. And you get to see other cultures. And the other thing, Trey, you learn that with everything going on, right? We're in a crazy time in the world right now. People are more alike than different. Right. If I can say my boss is a knucklehead in six languages, I got friends in six countries. And guess what, Trey? No teenagers listen to their parents. Doesn't matter what language, <laughs> you know, you find things like that out and, and it's it's really fun. And then you learn, um, you know, where to eat. Listen, if, you, if you're hungry, go to Europe, go to, you know, go to Italy, go to Spain, go to Portugal. That's where you want to be hungry. You, you, it's fantastic so yeah it, it's been that part of my career has been a great experience well comedy is the great unifier <clears throat> excuse me but a joke that works here in the u.s doesn't necessarily work outside of the states is there a most challenging place that you perform stand-up where you really had to think about the joke or the types of jokes that you were going to tell in order to get the crowd to do what you wanted them to which is of course laugh well here's what it, it is now our biggest export is our culture. So when you do American jokes, most of the world does know what you're talking about. But mm -hmm. some places you have to learn the slang, right? For instance, in Australia, when you say panties, to that, that's what we would call like bloomers. Like that would be what your grandmother wears, yeah. right? So if you got a panties joke and you do it, they're looking at you like, what are you a sicko? <laughs> you know, so you <laughs> you learn things like that. Um, we did some shows in Saudi Arabia for the Saudis. 
that was kind of unique because places like that, they do have specific rules about what not to make fun of. Like you can't make fun of the government and you can't make fun of the religion, you know, because they're very strict about it. So, you know, you, you just, listen, you have to remember this isn't the United States. So you, you watch your step, you know, but it's not, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult to not do, you know? Um, and, and it's a comic, it's challenges, man. Even listen, even working here, right. You get a corporate gig somewhere and they tell you, you gotta be G rated clean and don't do any politics. Cause we don't want to get the employees, you know, into their own political thing and stuff like so you you work around it and and it's really that's part of being a comic that creativity you can either be mad about it or take it as a challenge to make it fun and say hey how am i going to make this set work what am i going to do and then the other thing that that i love doing and it's really universal is crowd work yeah if you talk to the people about what they do and where they're from and then you start laughing at the differences in culture between places you know um i remember going to greece and this had to be 98 99 all the kids thought i was a pro ball player because of my size they all they were running up they wanted me to pick them up they wanted to take pictures they couldn't understand and so after a while i started using the same line i use on women in la which is that I played for the 89 Clippers. And that works, Trey, because no one knows who played for the 89 Clippers. It is my line, and don't mess this up for me, man. This is, yeah, I was there. Guys on the 89 Clippers aren't sure I wasn't on the 89 Clippers because <laughs> no one would admit that publicly. <laughs> it's like Danny Manning and a bunch of scrubs, right? Exactly, exactly. I was 13th man on a 12-man squad. <laughs> <laughs> and Donald Sterling was still a giant a-hole back then too. Yes, he was. So you are a big Clippers fan. The uh, NBA season is uh, close to tipping off. Uh, what are your expectations for LA's other team this year? Kawhi is back healthy, supposedly. Uh, Paul George is obvious, obviously is still part of things too. I mean, do you have hopes that this team can actually make a push for a championship this year? Unfortunately... I think we're a middle of the pack team. Yeah. Um, Denver is still going to be just super hard to match, super hard to beat. You know, Kawhi and PG, listen, there's a thing with the Clippers. When you come to the Clippers, at some point, your knee just explodes for no reason. It just, one day you're just like, hey, I was fine yesterday. My knee exploded. Um, it's going to be tough. They're, they're old vets, right, to play the whole season. But the other, the problem is their contracts are so big they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay. Now, I'm trying to, I'm hoping Harden doesn't come to the Clippers. There's all this talk. Harden's cancer wherever he goes. James, he's a great player individually, but that's just it individually. So, yeah, it, it looks like middle of the pack. Who knows? It's a long season. You know, when you're a Clipper fan, hope springs eternal. And at the very least, for the last 10 years, we've been enjoying pounding the Lakers. It's like, yeah, there are no rings. But every time you beat the Lakers, it just feels good. So uh, looking forward to next season when the new arena opens, because one of the problems the Clippers have, there's and Chris Paul complained about this all the time, and it is true, there's no home court advantage. Mm -hmm. There's always so many fans from the other team, especially if they're playing, you know, the Lakers or Golden State or Phoenix or so. So many people come out, Chicago and New York, there are so many people from Chicago and New York living in LA that they have no home court advantage. So the new place, Steve Ballmer, the owner, setting it up where there's a certain section where it's all gonna be Clipper fans. So that'll help. And you know, I grew up in New York. Listen, I grew up a Nick fan and I was a Nick and Clipper fan and my friends made me, you know, they said, look, you gotta pick one or the other. So I've been sticking with the Clippers ever since uh i love the team we had a great shot if if blake griffin had heart lob city might have won blake had a habit of disappearing in the fourth quarter or under pressure but we had a good run there it's always going to be fun and listen trey the tickets are still cheaper than the lakers so i'll be there did i mention i played for him back in 89 
Yeah, he played for him back in 89. And by the way, Danny Manning is another testament to guys joining the Clippers and their knees just blowing up too. Right? Oh, it happens over and over. Unfortunately, Sean Livingston's leg bent backwards. It was it was ridiculous. It, it's kind of a weird jinx the team has. So, but you know, um, Kmart's, uh, Kmart's son being on the team, that, that athleticism is going to be great. They, they'll be a good team. It, you know what you learn? Um, I think NBA fans learn this watching. It's hard to win a championship, right? People think it's easy and they're a repeat team, but then when you really get into it and watch it, it takes a lot to win a championship, you know? So I think this year, uh, Milwaukee, you know, with Dame and Giannis, if they have a rhythm that that's going to be a tough team to beat. Uh, Jimmy Butler, who knew? Who knew? that Jimmy could carry a team right to the finals by himself. That We knew he was good. We didn't know he was that good. So it'll be fun watching it this season and seeing how we do. Yes, it will. All right, uh, Alonzo, before I let you go, you are a, a big car guy. So I wanted to ask you this question because we're starting to see muscle cars going fully electric. But as they go fully electric, they're also still trying to maintain the old school qualities of part of what makes these cars so cool. For instance, uh, certain muscle cars that are electric now, I forget if it's the Corvette or another one, are digitizing the uh, the rumble of the engine, even though the car is no longer making an annoy making noises because it's electric. What do you think about that? Well, you know who was, I think BMW was the first to do that. And they amplified the sound of the engine through the car speakers in the car. Um and unfortunately, Trey, I know too much about cars. I know how they work. So electric motors to all your fans and listeners. The reason the cars are so quick is an electric motor is at full power instantly. It doesn't have to accelerate like a gasoline engine. That's why they're so quick. And you know how they feel like. <laughs> it's not my thing. Listen, I get it. People love them. Have fun. I'm not into electric cars. I still like gas. Um I like cheap gas more than expensive gas, but I still like gas. I like the feel of a car. I have my dog. He's a he's a great Dane. He's a I love my dog. He has good taste because he barks at electric cars. He just doesn't like them. Whenever they go by, he's like, "What the hell is that?" You know. I'm like, "You have good taste." It, it's not going to be. I've been to um, a Formula E, which is Formula One racing with electric cars. Huh. The the cars are. It's the weirdest thing when the only sound you hear are the tires. You hear the tires on the pavement. That's the only sound. So it's kind of odd. But at the same time, I don't need fake engine noises. You know, right. I'm not, that's not going to do it for me. Um, this guy told me once, he said, you know, the reason he said, the reason you don't like electric cars is they're not really cars, they're appliances. And that's kind of it. It's an appliance to get from point A to point B. And again, I get it, all the technology, this and that. I don't like self-driving technology because I ride motorcycles and, you know, I don't need people completely not paying attention when their car runs me down. But it's a change. If you have an electric car with fake sound like an engine, you probably don't want to pull up a bunch uh, up near a bunch of muscle car guys. Well, Just saying. You may not. <laughs> and by the way, as far as the self-driving cars go, Alonzo, I I guess this was probably prevalent back in April, but the self-driving cars are all over downtown now, and it's a complete disaster, too. I don't know if you've seen the stories coming out of San Francisco where these cars don't know how to handle certain situations. Like, I've gotten... Well, here's, I, here's I've gotten why I, I am convinced self-driving technology will never work. Because no matter how smart the engineer is who designs the car... You cannot match human stupidity. It's impossible. There's no algorithm to match. So there's always somebody who does something that the self-driving car is not equipped for. You know what I mean? Just just whether they make a crazy turn, walk in, but what, there's something that your self-driving vehicle cannot adapt to. So as many have said, the only way self-driving cars will work is if everyone is in one, at which point you're not driving, you're just going along for a ride. So no, I'm not not a fan. And the, the other thing is they lie to the consumer, right? You buy one of these cars 
and they tell you it can drive itself. And then you, you take your hands off the wheel, you're watching porn, you're sleeping in the back seat, whatever, and your car runs into something. They say, oh, we didn't say it drove itself. Like, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. You told them it could drive them itself. So not a, not a fan of self-driving. Hope you pay attention. The only uh, good thing is I'm very big. So if one of those little self-driving cars hits me, I can probably hit it back. But for the average person, that might be a problem. <laughs> I hit one of these self-driving cars, and unfortunately, it didn't tint it. But uh, I'm not quite as big as you. You did play for the 1989 Clippers, after all. That's right. That's right. Here's another thing, and it's going to be really interesting when, you know, I don't know if Austin has as many lawyer billboards per mile as we do here, you know, but who do they sue? Who did, do you sue the person, the company that made the car? Do you sue the person who was in not driving the car? You know how to, listen, our country is all about lawsuits. That's going to be the ultimate determination of who this, they be like, well, who can we sue? Who can we sue? And, you know, it's unfortunate, but I don't know. Uh, it'll be one more thing for me to make fun of, and hopefully I don't get get hit on a, if I get hit on the way to the mothership and blow my knee out, I am truly a Clipper fan. That's really the ultimate Clipper move right there. Either that or after you've gotten that late night order of voodoo donuts. One of the two <laughs> proves your Clippers fandom. Alonzo, thank you so much for the time today, man. Safe travels to and from Austin. I hope we can do, it this, uh, do this again at some point. I appreciate you, man. This was fun. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. We'll talk to you next time on Books on Pod. <laughs>